together when they re-enter. But it's so fast, he says, you can't even feel it. You can't tell them most of the time that anything has happened. Well, uh, isn't that interesting? Uh, so they could literally, with that mode of travel, they can be here any time they want, even a, a come down to the day. Well, actually, they don't even live in the same time frame that we do. Uh, they say soon, and many of our scientists are understanding it now, that uh, we can actually move up and down the time track, so to speak, and visit other time periods. Uh, they don't live in the same time pulse or track that we do. You know, we hop in our car in the morning and we navigate freeways to get where we're going. Right. They do a similar thing in these beam ships. They leave their planet. They navigate up and down time tracks and go to whatever time frame they want to just as simply. So the Pleiades that they are living in are not in the same time frame that we are watching with our eyes. If we were to zip to the Pleiades right now to the planets they say they come from, they, they, would be, they, they wouldn't be there. They wouldn't be there. They wouldn't be there. And this would account then for why we get no electronic form of communication or anything else from them. Well, that and the fact that uh, the Pleiades that we know of are small blue suns, which are young and aren't even capable of supporting life yet. So they're coming from a different time track than we are where they can exist there. So they're navigating the time tracks like we navigate freeways and they just go where they want. I've got gotcha. you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so, anyway, uh, thank you for that explanation. I was very curious. Now, uh, here was Billy at this point. How old? Billy would have been about, uh, what, 35 then. I think. 35, 37, right. yeah. These are when the contacts resumed. Yeah, he's and, got his family started, and he's standing there, and he's got his little camera out, and they're telling him that they've decided they want him to start taking photos. And they want him to seek publicity. Mm -hmm. They want him to tell his story to the newspapers and magazines and draw attention to himself. Uh, that I think they just really wanted to see, you know, what was going to happen. It was kind of like an experiment for them. Well, uh, Billy does. He shoots a couple of rolls of film. And uh, she says, well, I'll be back every week. Uh, I'll send you telepathic messages. We'll get together. I'll answer your questions. You can take more photos. And let's play it by ear and see how things go. So, he started taking pictures of everything in sight. And by the way, I have a whole bunch of his early photographs, uh, that you, the ones you've sent me. Mm -hmm. uh, at no point did he take any pictures of the people that he was contacting. Uh, he did. He took one picture of Semyasi once, and she asked him not to give copies to anybody. She seemed to be very concerned about having her image uh, around. So he said he wouldn't do it. Uh, I know he has taken pictures on several occasions of some of the other Pleiadians that have visited him also, and they do exist. They're in his photo album over at his house, but he wouldn't let me have any copies of those. Have you seen them? Uh, yeah. What I've seen is about six or seven pictures of them around the house, out in front of the house, and standing by a craft. In all the pictures, the face is blacked out. Uh, he's done that some with like a blotter or something like that. What do they look like otherwise? Just like us. They're human, just like we are. Uh, they're telling us that's the reason they even take an interest in us, that our forefathers were also their forefathers, uh -huh. that we have common ancestry way back, and that once we leave Earth and have the technology to do it, we will discover that the human form, variations of the human form, just like ours, proliferates all over the universe. The human form is a very common, natural part of the evolution of the universe. We'll find them everywhere. Well, that's comforting in a way. So, yeah. so you're suggesting when we do go out or when whoever it is comes here, they will not be bugs. They will be more or less as we are. Most of them will be. They say that they have discovered so far there are about 340 variations to the human form different sizes, shapes, skin color, eyes, fingers, and so forth, but pretty much all in the human form family, we might say. All right, Randolph, hold it right there. We'll be right back to you. My guest is Randolph Winters. We're talking about Billy Meyer, the Pleiades connection, and there's a lot more to go. The new year is here, and many of you, I know, have promised to try to increase your own standard of living. You know, have a better one, Randolph. All right. Um, so... Um, he began to take these photographs that uh, that now many of us have, uh, that I have, and they are clear, shocking, good renditions of what we think of as flying saucers, and there appear to be several different types. Is that correct? Yes, there are. The uh, first pictures are uh, what's uh, commonly known as the Variation 1 among UFO investigators. He shot several rolls of film. See, the ship would come in, and they would literally pose. They would uh, give him a few minutes to get his pictures. 
Right. It's, all, it's really kind of interesting that uh, here's this man in Switzerland that has this uh, wonderful opportunity in life to do this. And would you believe he's taking all those pictures that you've seen, Art, all the 1,200 pictures over the years. He shot them with a little $40 camera that he found at a trash can. Yeah. He was poor, didn't have any money, and when they told him he's going to be able to take pictures, uh, he's only got one arm. He had lost his arm in a bus accident. Found this camera uh, damaged in a trash can that someone had discarded. Liked it because it has a little wheel on the back that he can advance the film. Right. And so it was handy for a one-armed man. Oh, I see. So he uh, he could he could handle it real easy, load the film, you know, and shoot it because he's only got the one hand to work with. So he started shooting all these pictures with his little camera. Since he lives out in the countryside and didn't know a thing about cameras or film, he he would shoot two or three rolls of film each time that they had a contact, and then he'd mail it into Zurich to the film developer and wait to get his pictures back. All right, we've only got a moment before the top of the hour. In all, um, how many photographs did Billy Meyer actually take? Over the three-year period, about 1,200, uh, actually about 2,000. About half of them have disappeared off into private collections, but there's still about 1,200 available. Wow. All right, uh, Randolph, hold on. We'll be right back, joined by more stations at that time, and continue the saga of Billy Meyer, and we're about to bring you up to date. So stay right where you are. This is CBC. This hour of Art Bell was recorded for rebroadcast at this time. Please do not call. Call Art Bell in the Kingdom of Nine. Toll free at 1-800-618-8255, 1-800-618-TALK. First time callers, 702-727-1222, 702-727-1222, or use the wild card line at 702-727-1295. This is Coast to Coast AM on the CBC Radio Network. It absolutely is. Good morning, everybody. A hard turn out of the news and current events this morning. My guest is Randolph Winters. Imagine a remote area of Switzerland. A farmer is contacted by extraterrestrials from a cluster of stars called the Pleiades. Their mission is to raise the consciousness of the people of Earth through the understanding of our role in creation. Now, Randolph Winters, my guest, went to Switzerland, a story we're about to tell, and spent time with Billy Meyer. So far, we've heard the story of his childhood, the first contact, the manner in which the alleged ships traverse all of this space through uh, uh, dimensional uh, uh, portals, I guess you would say, or dimensional travel, uh, really travel through time as well. We've heard about the childhood of Billy Meyer, and then amazingly, and the thing that I think makes this story worth hearing, all the photographs that Billy Meyer took, uh, many, many photographs, as many as 1,200 photographs, clear Good images of flying saucers. There are new photographs. I have some of them here this morning. In a moment, the story continues. Who is in California, near your Belinda, I guess. And um, we will continue now with the story. Um, and some are going to consider it far-fetched, uh, and it certainly sounds that way, until you begin to put your hands on and see the photographs taken by Billy Meyer. Now, uh, back to Randolph Winters. Uh, Randolph, I guess uh, at this point in the story, uh, we've gone through his childhood. He's in his mid-30s now. He's taking photographs like crazy and having a lot of interaction with, uh, with these aliens. Um, what I want to do now is, I guess, find out how in the world you managed to get in on all this, how you managed to make contact with Billy Meyer. How did you do that? Well, actually, I came. Uh, I started seeing the photos myself about 1979 when they found their way to America. Billy first published his photos in newspapers and magazines around Europe. He lives in Switzerland. So they started appearing in uh, periodicals around there. And uh, people, scientists, UFO investigators in the European area started you know, looking into the case. People by the thousands around Europe were flocking to his home, and we knew nothing about it here in America. And then uh, Colonel Wendell Stevens, uh, who's into UFO investigation here in the United States, heard about it, went to Switzerland, looked into it himself. 
And I saw some of the photos he was bringing back from Switzerland, and uh, when I saw them, I thought, my, these are amazing. I was shocked by them, like most people are the first time that they see them. Because, Absolutely. You know, we're used to seeing UFOs in the sky, a white blurry object, and maybe one or two photos at best, but nothing like, uh, you know, what you're looking at there. And Meyer is taking pictures in the daytime. They're posing for them. They're beautiful. They're clear. And they're so obviously real, you just have to stop whatever you're doing and take a second look. Well, let me stop you right there and take a a, a second look myself. Now, all of these photographs, no doubt, have been examined again and again and again. Actually, not all of them. Uh, Well, there are many of them, enough of them. Yeah, during that time period, uh, Stevens and some other people from Genesis Publishing, they went over there investigated the case, spent about a year there, went over the photos with all the technology that was available at the time, and literally gave them a clean bill of health. Not only did they, uh, you know, give up on trying to prove they were a hoax, they actually discovered that the craft that they were looking at in the photos, uh, that the energy coming off of the craft was detectable in certain ranges of ultraviolet light. Uh And so these days, we we know that now, so if you want to fake a UFO photo, you're going to have to be very careful that your model, whatever you're doing, puts off a gravitational field because we know how to detect it these days. So, In effect, a lot of work was done and thousands of dollars were put into all sorts of thermograms, edge enhancements, scans. You know, they did everything they could uh, with the knowledge that they had and uh, the photos came out real. And Plus, we also have to remember that they're all shot by a one-armed man in a farm in Switzerland who can barely run a camera and doesn't have the sophistication or the knowledge to be able to fool people at this level. And these were all shot in 1975 and 1978, uh, long before we had digitizing and computer equipment, you know, that would make it simple to fake something these days. What kind of camera was it? Uh, I'm trying to remember. I think it was a Japanese camera. Uh, it was either a little Canon or something like that. Uh, I've forgotten now. It was just a little $40 box camera with a winder wheel on the back. and 35 millimeter? Yeah. Uh, he snapped these pictures. Actually, they examined the camera and found that it was jammed on F-14, who uh, apparently whenever it was discarded and Billy found it, uh, the camera had been tossed around, was cracked, and you couldn't change the lens. So all of his photos um, are shot at F-14, <laughs> which means if you're into photography, you know, that controls the depth of field. So anything for about the first 10, 15 feet is going to be in blur, and it's just short of infinity. So if something's too far off, it's not going to be real sharp. Mm-hmm. So we have a man in Switzerland who for a three-year period takes hundreds and hundreds of beautiful daytime clear photos. And these are this is the first time we've ever seen anything like this. So, of course, it gets our attention. And it lends credibility to the idea that he's actually having contacts and conversations with somebody, somebody, whoever they are, from another place. And, of course, the premise is that if they have the technology to fly here, they obviously must be from another world. Okay, so you began seeing these photographs yourself. Right. Uh, they made it here to the States. They do, and uh, I'm, I'm very curious. I'm, you know, it'd be kind of... It, kind of, it preoccupies me, actually. At the time, I was a businessman and owned a series of uh, retail stores. And ah, that was my next question. In <laughs> other words, you were not a ufologist no. until this came along. No, actually, at the time, I lived in Santa Monica, California, and I was selling ceramic tile, and I owned five retail stores, and I was just I saw this. It stopped me in my tracks, and a mm-hmm. bell went off in my head and said, this is important. If somebody from another world is actually coming here, then imagine what we could learn from them. Of course. And I think I carried the pictures around and told everybody I could about it for several years. And then ultimately, about 1986, I decided i got to go see for myself and started writing letters to Switzerland saying I'd like to come over for a visit. And uh, as it turned out, uh, letters were sent back saying that Billy doesn't see visitors any longer, that uh, he's had it with the public. He's not interested in having anybody else come over and ask him a lot of questions and investigate the case. Thank you very much. You know, that's an interesting attitude uh, based on the um, uh, the mission that they gave him, mm-hmm. which was to publicize all of this, to get the photographs out. Well, he did for a while, and then he literally just got overwhelmed. Uh, he couldn't take all of it emotionally, people challenging him, threatening him. And um, to Billy, who had had so many uh, amazing experiences all of his lifetime, and was posed and ready to, you know, like share all of his wonderful knowledge and education. 
found himself instead uh, besieged with reporters and media people that, uh, of course, you know, were trying to get at the bottom of things and uh, took the angle like reporters will, the prove it to me angle. Let's, you know, let's see what's here. Sure. And uh, which is what we have to do in our society. And Billy couldn't deal with that too long. He put up with it, uh, you know, for four or five years, and eventually his, his family was. Uh, the situation was getting very difficult. His wife was getting upset with people trampling through the yard, and thousands of people had, you know, come to the farm. So Billy finally just closed the doors, and he had formed a group around himself of people that were willing to help him and help him disseminate the information. And he just decided he wasn't going to be public at all. He was going to write books and uh, put them out in German. And if people wanted to read or hear about it, they'd just have to read a book. But he wasn't going to talk to anybody anymore. I can understand that. Yeah, you know, and, uh, he, he took it as far as he could, and then he got overwhelmed. His life was pretty much destroyed, and he had no privacy. And then, so he said, you know, I'm willing to share, but let's just start doing it on my terms, and uh, you know, read my book, please. All right. So you fired letters off, did not get an encouraging response. Then what? Well, I went anyway. Uh, I went. Uh, I was going back and forth to Italy occasionally for business, and I decided, well, I'll go. So I sent a letter, and uh, actually the, that letter was more well received. They had heard a little bit about me that I had been you know, giving some talks and lectures in the Los Angeles area about the case. It seemed open to me coming over all of a sudden, and so I went. And I went over in the summer of '87 was the first time I went, and uh, got there. Uh, spent three weeks at the farm there. There's about 15 people that live there, including Billy and his wife and his kids. Almost a commune. Yeah, it kind of is that kind of situation, uh, which is not uncommon, actually, in Switzerland. It's very common in the hills for several people to be living in big farms. But sure. <clears throat> his situation uh, was more like a commune in that all the people that were there were there because of him and to support his work. Some, some might even say cult. Well, a cult is usually when a commune becomes a little fanatical and gets closed-minded, and that did happen over there. Uh, and that you know, made the situation quite difficult and why people here in America really have not heard very much about it. You know, the, the group over there started to uh, control the information and dish it out to you know, who they wanted to and start charging for it, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so it kind of tightened up. Right. But anyway, when I got there, uh, they were fairly open. They were pretty nice to me. I had a good time. But uh, I noticed right away that uh, Billy wouldn't talk to me, and uh, he would avoid me. And uh, I thought, well, that's kind of strange. And But I had heard, you know, that he just wasn't open to visitors anymore. So being a patient person, and uh, I just started, you know, milking cows and cutting grass and fixing fences during the day. And all the other people there were very kind to me and answered my questions. And I... Uh, <clears throat> was suddenly given about 2,000 pages of Billy's personal notes to start pouring over while I was there. So what you did was almost become native. You turned native, huh? I did. I kind of decided to blend in and just become one of them mm -hmm. and um, got along with them all okay and figured, well, you know, patience. I'll just, uh, you know... I'll blend in here, and Billy will come around, and we'll see what happens. All right. And uh, besides, I felt a little bit like I guess I do need to prove myself to this man that I'm serious, that I'm here for the right reasons, and I'm not, you know, I'm not here trying to steal anything or, you know, uh, you know, bother them. I just came because I wanted to know what was going on. All right. So he laid a couple thousand pages on you. He did. I started reading those, and inside of these pages, I started feeling like I'd had the contacts myself. That here was word for word, uh, they transmitted to him, the actual conversations on all of his contacts, uh, every time they picked him up and had a contact with him. Most of the contacts, it turns out, had lasted for two or three hours. They picked him up, taking him in the craft with them somewhere. They would sit somewhere in a quiet place and answer questions, questions that he had from himself, uh, friends had given him. They would then spend time educating about him about things that they felt were important, and all of it was in these pages. So I'm reading them, and I, I tell you, I was fascinated. I, I was so totally preoccupied with that stuff, I couldn't do anything else. And I was up all night reading, you know. And uh, so I stayed there for three weeks, and uh, I had to come back because I was uh, job problems, and I couldn't stay any longer. Sure. So I, my vacation was over, and I thanked them all very much and left, and I uh, came back home. And they sent me, gave me copies of all the notes and the books that Billy had written, and everybody was very nice to me. But you still had not had a uh, significant conversation with Billy Meyer. No, he hadn't even uh, talked to me yet. I see. So I came home, and I'd only been home about a week, and uh, the phone rang, and it was the, the people from the farm, and Billy was on the other end. 
and he wanted to thank me for coming over and uh, and, and said, uh, you're welcome to come back any time now. And I thought, well, that's nice. So I, I hmm. couldn't come back right away because I had, you know, work. But uh, a few months later, I decided I would go back, and I did. And when I went back, I stayed for about four months that time at the house, and Billy was real friendly, came to pick me up at the train station, and we just kind of became buddies and uh, hung out together all day long. And so then I got to know him real well. And then we just we spent five, six hours every day just sitting on the front porch or in the kitchen talking, and I had him all to myself for a whole summer. Well, then it's a good time to ask you, uh, what what was Billy Meyer all about? I mean, what kind of personality, what kind of person was this man? That's important to know. Yeah, it is, and he is different uh, than most. He's quite different than most people you're ever going to meet in life. He's more similar to, uh, I would say, a guru in India. Uh, he is a quiet uh, person who meditates a lot. He's peaceful. He's never lived a life like we have. He's never had a car payment and a credit card. The uh, majority of his lifetime has been spent in the pursuit of spiritual knowledge. Uh, he spends a lot of time uh, contemplating his life, nature. His ability to understand the language of key and sign and communicate with nature, beings of other worlds, higher consciousness, has led him to totally down a path different than the rest of us have been. And so because of that, he's not a small talk conversationalist. You don't shoot the breeze with Billy about the local news and, you know, your car and your kids and things. He Current events. Yeah, he's not into that. Yeah. Uh, he's, uh, <laughs> but you can ask him a question, say, uh, Billy, you know, how was the universe created? And for three hours he just goes on and on and on like a teacher. He's a fascinating guy, real friendly, kind of, he's short, about 5'6". Uh, it kind of reminds me of a Santa Claus type, real smiley, friendly, happy little fella. Maybe you can give me the short version, uh, Randolph. That's a really good question. How was the universe created? Oh, gee. Well, <laughs> um, I did ask that, and uh, we were sitting in the kitchen, and uh, uh, whenever he starts to talk uh, on the radio there in the kitchen, uh, everybody at the house there keeps the stack, uh, stacks of paper there on the radio. And when Billy's in the mood to talk, you want to take a lot of notes. So I, uh, he, I asked him that question one day, what is a universe? And uh, he proceeded to start explaining it to me. And I, so I started grabbing paper and drawing pictures and taking notes. And we spent the whole afternoon going over it. And in effect, and we can talk more about this as we go on, but uh, my question was, was <clears throat> mostly about what is a universe? Is it a physical thing or is this just our imagination or what the heck is it? Good question. He says that, as it was explained to him, that the Pleiadians, because of their technology, have been able to move in time and actually go back to the origin of the universe and watch it develop. So they have studied it as it has developed, and they now have a pretty good understanding of what it is that we are living in. So they've been able to write their own version of a history of time. I would say so. Uh, if we were to go to a Pleiadian world and go to a classroom, say, at a school there, <clears throat> they would... Uh, have their own textbooks on how the universe came about, and uh, here's what we would understand. We would find out that uh, they have discovered that what we live in, what we think of as the universe, you know, we look at the stars around us and the planets, and yes. you know, we just don't really have a clue where the heck we are or what's going on. So for our listeners out there, uh, let's say if they had a blank paper laying in front of them, they took a pencil, and if they drew an egg, a uh, shape of an egg on a piece of paper, <clears throat> that the universe if you could fly outside of it, is egg-shaped. And then if you could take that egg, say, and uh, cut it in half, like you might just slice the thing right in half and take the top off so you could look down inside and see what's in there, right? then you would see that the universe is divided into bands or rings. It looks similar to like what we'd see in a tree trunk. And that there are seven bands or rings to a universe. And if we count from the outside, calling that the seventh band, yes. and if we move in two to the fifth band, that's where we live. That the way the universe is constructed, it's almost holographic, that the only place there is material existence, like we are aware of, is in that fifth band. That's where all the stars and the planets are. That's the only place there is a material presence. Material presence. That's the only place where the three-dimensional reality that we can sense exists. The other bands, you know, the seven, six, four, three, two, and one in the center right. are creational energy. There's nothing solid there. But the universe is divided off, sectioned off into these seven different bands. 
So we live in that fifth band, and what has happened is as the universe evolved, at the beginning even the fifth band was non-solid. It was creational energy also. But as the universe has evolved, the fifth band uh, over long periods of time evolves, and that's where the physical matter comes about. And eventually it starts the uh, gaseous state, and then the gases turn into elements, and then as we learn in school, you know, the universe begins to form from the gases, then the planets, then the mineral kingdom, then the food kingdom, and then the people, animal kingdom, then the people kingdom. Just pretty much, you know, as we've learned in school. Yes. So, in effect, we have what a universe is, uh, is an egg-shaped hologram divided up into different sections. Uh, the dimensions are in the fifth belt. The fifth belt, the ex uh, where we exist, is actually divided, you might say, into, into dimensions which are... Uh, a dimension is the division between the speed of particles, is the way of saying it. Randolph, is all of this a creation? Yeah. Creation is the spiritual source that had an idea to make a universe. Otherwise, the otherwise known as God? Uh, well, the Pleiadians say there's a difference between creation and what we perceive as a God. Now, a creation, they say, is just the creational source. It is the wisdom, the energy that has an idea to make a universe and is responsible for the creation of all matter, including us, our but that, spiritual. But that, that is, though, a spiritual entity of some sort, is that correct? They don't think of it as an entity. They think of it because they say it is a collection of an infinite number of entities. All right, on that note, we've got a break here at the bottom of the hour. We'll come back and try to make sense of that. This is CBC. <laughs> Kingdom of Nye. You're hearing Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell on the CBC Radio Network. Good morning, everybody. I am Art Bell, and uh, I want to touch uh, on one unrelated, or maybe it is a related topic. We'll find out about that. You all know about the appearance of Michael Gordon Scallion, Gordon Michael Scallion, I should say, here on the program, and his predictions. They've shaken up a lot of people in the North uh, West and in the West as was predictable. There are a lot of rumors flying around about uh, activity or predicted activity, and I stress rumors, in the Seattle area. And I've received a number of faxes and phone calls, and I must tell you that as of tonight, I am unable to confirm any of them. So until you hear something official, do not jump to uh, any conclusions. And that would be, I guess, as much as I'm going to say about it. Uh, but there are a lot of rumors uh, flying around about this or that has been predicted, and they're not telling us. Uh, indeed, there has been nothing uh, official predicted and um, uh, by USGS uh, or anybody else that I am aware of. Uh, we had a rumor yesterday forwarded to us by a caller who said things were on alert here, hither and yon uh, up in the northwest in the Seattle area. No confirmation of that uh, either. All right. Uh, the Sea Crane Company, again, I have, uh, you would listen attentive, attentive, attentively, and I hope that uh, based on my word to you that I have a lot of photographs that really cannot be denied, you should listen attentively. Attentively. <laughs> Here once again is Randolph Winters. Uh, Randolph, you're back on the air, and we're discussing creation, and before we leave the topic, I want to try to understand what it is you're saying. Understood the nature of the universe you described, mm -hmm. but I don't understand who you or they are suggesting created it. All right, well, they don't know uh, who or what created the universe. They've discovered that there's a creational energy that creates universes, and that that energy has created an infinite number of universes. Beyond that, they don't really have a clue either. Okay. Uh, they, they admit they don't know everything. They just uh, you know, are more advanced than we technically, and they've learned answers to some questions, but not all of them. They're still figuring things out, too. They do want to make a point to us that you know, because of our limited technology and having not been able to roam the universe yet and figure things out, there is some confusion on our part about what God and what creational source is. They're telling us that what gods are 
gods are rulers or governors over a planet or a system of planets or groups of planets, that they are physical beings like ourselves but far more advanced who have gone through, you know, millions of lifetimes and have much greater knowledge than we do. So we perceive them as gods because of their great knowledge. But they don't create our spirits, and they don't control our lives. They do, however, manipulate our spirits. They do. They can manipulate our spirit, and from time to time, depending uh, on who they are and what their agenda might be, some of these gods may rule over a planet like they have Earth have in the past on Earth, and demanded worship and uh, you know and so forth for people to follow them. But they wanted to make it clear that Earth uh, is no longer at the moment is not ruled by a god. Uh, that we are free at this point to become responsible for ourselves. It's kind of our time as a civilization to grow up, shake off the bonds of uh, godship, I guess you might say, and realize our own potential and our connection to creation. Creation, they say, is a, uh, a spiritual source of energy that, uh, as near as they can tell, created the universe and causes the evolution of the universe Actually, they have a fascinating way of letting people understanding what creation is. And Billy was asking pretty much the same questions. And it is a very difficult thing to understand since because of our limited knowledge of how things work. They took Billy with them on one of their large craft. And when they were having this discussion on the ship about what is a creation, they said the best way to understand it is to experience it yourself. That quite frequently on the craft, they take children up in the ships and they have... They allow them to experience creation in a rather fascinating way. Earlier we talked about how the crafts can leave the three-dimensional reality art and yes. change and convert themselves into fine matter. Yes. What they do is they discover that once the ship is converted into fine matter and you are outside of the three-dimensional reality, you're not in your physical body right then. So you are, if you were in a craft and went with them for a ride, uh, once you were outside of the three-dimensional reality, out of your physical body, you would only be existing then as a spirit form or yes. soul, some people call it. Yes. Okay? Now, when you are not in your physical body, when you are just a spirit or a soul again, then your spiritual senses kind of kick in, your spiritual consciousness and spiritual subconscious, and you are then aware of your attachment to creation. In our physical bodies, we're so busy interacting with our physical senses, we don't pay attention to it, and most of us aren't even aware of what we can do with our spirit. But let's say, Art, they took you up in that craft, and you wanted to know about creation. They then, what they do is this. They take the ship, fly outside of a solar system, accelerate it, move over into hyperspace or this fourth dimensional place, wherever it is they go. You then would no longer be in your physical body. Now, normally these jumps into the uh, other dimensions are instantaneous, so you come right back and you're hardly even aware anything happened. However, they can hold themselves for seven minutes outside of the physical reality, and then you would not be in your physical body. You would just be your spiritual self again, and for seven minutes you would be aware of your connection to creation. And during that seven minutes, you would experience for yourself exactly your connection, what a creation is, and you would feel then exactly what's happening in there. They, Billy says it happened to him. He did it for seven minutes. And what you experience to begin with, he says, is this very bright white light that we talked about once before. Oh. Uh, the first thing you experience when the material body shuts down is your spiritual awareness immediately senses the spiritual energy, which first appears as the bright light. And then you notice that you really don't have any eyes. Your material body is gone. And then he says the next feeling is this immense feeling that you are somehow encompassed and surrounded by this infinite love, mm -hmm. that all around you there is the feeling of an infinite number of other spirit forms like yourself who care greatly for you, he says it is the most peaceful, wonderful feeling he's ever had. So the connection then is to the creation itself. To the, right. And he says the creation then creates all things, uh, but it is not something that needs to be worshipped. There's no value judgments there. Uh, it's just a very peaceful, loving place. This is where we go when we die, when we go over to the other side. There are no value judgments. No value judgments. There are no concepts of good or bad or heaven of hell, uh, nothing like that. Uh, those are just man-made concepts. The creation is a non-judgmental, 
uh, source of wisdom. That would seem to deny a lot of Christian teaching and uh, oh, yeah. religious teaching, period. Oh, yes, yeah, quite, quite different. And uh, he says that to him was the most important part of all of his experience with ETs over the years, was being able for seven minutes to really experience what creation is. All right, that's pretty heady stuff. Let's... Uh... For a second, ask, let me ask you about something a little lighter. What do we know, or maybe it isn't, what do we know about the Pleiadian civilization itself? In other words, about how they live. Uh, do they live as we do? Do they have homes? Do yeah. they have cities? What, what's the story there? Well, the Pleiadians are human just like us, still living in physical existence like uh, we do. You know, after a period of time, uh, they say we reincarnate millions of times, and eventually there's no need for the physical body, and we move in or evolve into other states with, beyond that. Mm -hmm. But they're still uh, evolving just like we are and living in a physical world as we do. They look like uh, we do. They're human. They marry, have children just like we do, but their world is quite different. Uh, we wouldn't fly there, for instance, and see large cities and cars and, you know, neon signs and fast food. Billy went there in 1984, was there for about three or four days. And when he went there, he said the planet is similar to ours, uh, which is one of the reasons they're so comfortable coming here, that it's primarily a water planet similar to ours. Mountains, streams, grassy areas, and so forth, very comfortable there. Mm -hmm. uh, but they don't live in big cities like we do. Instead, they live a far more spiritual existence where everybody's allowed their own space, their own path of discovery, and they live kind of quiet, peaceful lives, uh, almost like we did, you know, hundreds of years ago. And yet they follow technological development. Yes, they do. The planet is tremendously advanced technically, but it's almost unseen. Uh, it's as if nature comes first is the major priority. Their connection to nature and their spiritual connection to creation are the most important to them. So it's a very spiritually developed civilization. So when Billy was there, he said there's no evidence of the material realm like we see here. There's no money, economics. They're not caught up, you know, in the material existence or the Industrial Revolution like we are. Mm -hmm. But they've advanced way beyond that now, and now they've gone full spectrum and become more of a spiritual society. Did they at one time have a technological society similar to ours? Yes. Historically, he says, they have records showing tens of thousands of years of their ancestors going through the cycles just like we are, uh, where they had wars, they fought, they blew up planets, they destroyed themselves. They went through all the same things that we've been doing until a certain point where a large enough number of their society gained in spiritual awareness strong enough that eventually the people that were seeking spiritual consciousness overcame the more material, grounded people on the planet, and they made a shift in their society. They became a more spiritual society and laid down their guns and quit fighting, but it took a long time. And they see us going through still a few cycles, too, before we get there. And I think this is one of the reasons that they kind of observe us and don't want to get too involved. You know, do, do we know, um, have any way of knowing how far along in that cycle we have come and how far we have to go before they consider us to be civilized by their standards? Uh, I think, well, we might get an answer in that they said they thought it would be 300 to 500 years before they would open up any kind of public commerce with us, how, before we might calm down enough where they would be willing to do that. How disappointing. It is for us right now, but then on, on the other hand, that's pretty quick, really. Uh, we're, we're accelerating tremendously fast right now. You know, look where we've come in 100 years, and we're right on the verge now of joining up with the family of man throughout the universe and finding our place and things. So, you know, for the next 100 years uh, here on Earth are going to be tremendous. You know, the, the, the history books that report this time period uh, <laughs> are going to look back 100 years, and we won't believe what life will be like on this planet, you know, down the road just 100 years. Okay, Randolph, what about the crop circles, the UFO sightings, the abduction cases, all of modern current ufology? Uh, what is it that we are experiencing? Is it something or is it nothing? It is something. All over the world, and I travel a lot, I get around uh, doing talks and doing promotions. I have a new book out on the market called The Pleiadian Mission, and I've been out, you know, doing bookstore talks and things, and that gets me in touch with a lot of people. And I'm, you know, and I've been to England and I talk to people about the crop circles. What I'm seeing, Art, is that all over the place there are people and groups of people having experiences with different ETs, and they are all relatively similar. They're having them with groups of people who are learning to meditate, 
who are calm, who are seeking out spiritual answers, and they're finding ways to accelerate their consciousness, or I say, might say raise their consciousness through meditation, and they're starting to receive visions, ideas. Just recently I was in Florida where those new photos that you're looking at there were taken. The group of people in Florida that are having contact with the Pleiadians now uh, are uh, having an amazing time. They are learning to meditate and push their minds to a certain point of spiritual awareness and they're receiving images, pictures, and voices now from the ETs that are helping them learn. And I hear this is happening in Seattle, Oregon, uh, Texas, uh, a lot of places I've been where I'm seeing the same thing happen. So I... All right. Why have the Pleiadians chosen to contact this group in Florida that has supplied you with the photographs that I now have? Why? Well, well that's pretty fascinating. You know, the Meyer photos are wonderful, but he's the only one who ever took them. That's right. And so for years we've always argued, you know, did he fake them? Does he know something the rest of us don't know? There hasn't been anybody else take those photos of those kinds of crafts to back up his claims. And now, uh, here in Florida, just a few months ago, while I'm down there giving a talk, a man comes forward and uh, tells me that he's been having contact uh, with the Pleiadians for 29 years, that uh, his contacts have gone on for a long period of time. All throughout the Meyer contacts, he was aware of it. And he uh, opens up his photo album and proceeds to start showing me some of his photos, some of which you've got there. And I'm, again, kind of blown away because here again, uh, we've got photos of the same craft, the Pleiadian ships, uh, the round saucer type, the small telemeter craft, even their time travel craft with its unusual edges and so forth around it. Let me take, look, I've got one photo in my hand. It is of a, it's a pretty clear shot of the UFO, but at the bottom of the photograph, there is um, a building. Mm -hmm. There is a building. Uh, where is that building? That building is in Miami, and it's part of the apartment complex where the man lives. It's wow. taken right off the balcony. Actually, his wife took the picture. They were standing on the balcony, and uh, several of the craft appeared just a few hundred feet, uh, you know, right off uh, from their apartment. And it was there for two or three minutes, and uh, they shot several pictures. Uh, we're talking about a busy area in the city. Miami's a big city. And that's right, and this is a... Well, by scale, and, it, it, you know, it's a little tough to tell, not, not that tough. Uh, this is a very large or pretty large craft, I would say. Yeah. And it's quite clearly a flying saucer, as we think of them. Uh, I would say almost with serrated edges. That's, that's hard to mm -hmm. describe. And uh, a, a significant dome. And uh, it's quite clear. Now, I'd like to put you on the spot and ask you if you would allow us to... Um, uh, to publish these photographs in a newsletter. You're certainly welcome to. As a matter of fact, uh, because of our last show, I've had so many people ask me about the photos, and I'm just starting to get them together. We're putting them on tape to make a new videotape, and uh, mm -hmm. I've had quite a few people call me the last few days, and so I, I decided I, I made prints of quite a few of them. I've got about ten different ones laying here on the table of the new photos. Yes. And for your audience tonight, anybody who'd like to have a collection of those uh, before we get the tape out, if, if people want to get these photos, then... I'm going to take the ten photos that we've got and a short article, about four or five pages, about the contacts and how they were taken and make them available to people. If they want to get a collection of them, they can call my 800 number, and uh, for $20, I'll send them a set of photos and an article about them, and that they can get a set of their own photos before we get the tape out. All right, uh, but you'll also allow us to publish these in our newsletter, which comes out in a few months. You bet. You know, we're, we're not going to hold these photos back. We want everybody to know about them, discuss them, and have a look at them. So, uh, you're, 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 you're All right, what's your, what's your 800 number? My 800 number is 800-934-6423. And anybody's welcome to call in there. They can also, uh, you know, they can get the book or the videotape. But we'll get the pictures out to people, and uh, they can send us a check or use their Visa or Master Charge right there on the line, and we'll send them the, these photos. And, uh, you know, they can have a look at them before, because it's going to be a few months before we get a videotape together. It's going to be uh, 
Oh, a, a good couple of months before I can get them in the newsletter as well. Uh, but Incidentally, too, I did make a GIF file uh, out of the one of the ones you're looking at there, the one that has that pie-shaped edges around it. Yes. And I posted that on CompuServe and America Online. Excellent. So any of our computer friends, because I want everybody to see them, anybody that's out there that's online can dial into the New Age forums in there and download the GIF file for themselves. All right. Well, I think it is very, very important uh, because a lot hangs on the these photographs, a lot of, you know, with regard to the credibility. I mean, the average guy sitting out there going, oh, come on. But these really are pretty impressive photographs, folks. I'm sitting here looking at them right now. These are new Pleiadian beam chip photographs. And I'd like to understand a little more about the people that took them. Uh, we're headed toward the top of the hour here. So uh, we're going to pause. And then when we come back, I'm going to open up the telephone lines. So people can ask you questions, and I imagine there will be many. I'm sure there's much I missed, and uh, and we'll let folks uh, interact with you. How would that be? Fine. I just returned from a visit with the people down in Florida, and there's quite a story to tell. They're taking more photos, and just recently the group down there has had some experiences of their own, which we'll tell everybody about in the next hour, and it's becoming quite fascinating. All right, well, that'll be a good place to pick it up because we'll have more radio stations joining us. All right, Randolph, stay right where you are. My guest is Randolph Winters. And fortunately, we come to you this morning with more than just conversation. We come with photographs that you are going to be able to study. I have these photographs and didn't want to do this program until they were in my hand. They are, and they are impressive. The Pleiadian Connection... Billy Meyer, and now new beam ship photographs. We'll be back with your call shortly. This is CBC. This hour of Art Bell was recorded for rebroadcast at this time. Please do not call. of Nye. You're hearing Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell. Much more than just a talk show. To participate in the program, call toll-free 1-800-618-8255. That's 1-800-618-8255. This is the CBC Radio Network. It absolutely is. Good morning, everybody. It is a holiday weekend. Monday being President's Day, it's a long holiday weekend ahead of us. I'm Art Bell. This is the largest live overnight talk program in America, and we are not doing what we usually do this morning. My guest is Randolph Winters, and we're taking a hard turn away from the uh, current event structure of the program, which is normal. Uh, actually, it's normal for us to take a turn away from it. I've done that for years. Uh, it drives some people crazy. And uh, that's okay. It's part of what I do. And for those of you that uh, cannot stomach or handle anything that you cannot understand, it would be a good time to tune out. We're following the story uh, of Billy Meyer. It is one of the best documented UFO accounts in all history, in all of our recorded history, maybe even the best. 1,200 color photographs of ships that uh, visited this young Swiss farmer over a, actually over a, a great period of his life with a bit of an intermission in the uh, formative years. And uh, now, all of a sudden, there's somebody or a group in Florida that are getting new photographs of the same ships, UFOs, flying saucers. I've got brand new photographs in my hand which Randolph Winters has just given us permission to publish in an upcoming newsletter. How's that for uh, a bit of documentation? I think it was uh, big of him to allow us to uh, publish these, and so look for them in a future newsletter. And we're going to find out about these new photographs, these incredible new photographs from Randolph Winters in just a moment. I talked to my mom earlier. We're about to get the lines open a little bit more. Uh, information is what I want first uh, from Randolph, and that's about these current photographs, the ones we are going to publish. 
Uh, but then we're going to open up these lines and allow you to ask him questions about Billy Meyer, about the Billy Meyer story, about the new photographs, about the Pleiadian civilization, uh, about anything related you would like. Here are the numbers. First time callers to this program may call at area code 702 727 1222. 702 727 1222. The wild card direct dial lines are area code 702 727 1295. 702 727 1295. The toll free number for the West, if you're out West here, is 1 800 618 8255. 1 800 618 8255. East of the Rockies, anywhere back there, it's 1-800-825-5033. Anywhere east of the Rockies, 1-800-825-5033. With that, uh, back to my guest, Randolph Winters. Uh, Randolph, are you there? I'm still here. Good. How are you hanging in there? Oh, doing just fine. I'm kind of a night owl. Good. You need to be. All right, I have these photographs in my hand. These are new uh, Pleiadian beam, cra uh, beam craft, is that what you would call them? Beam ships, and beam they're ships. very exciting, as you can see, because yes. it's the first time in 20 years we've had someone else take photos of these same craft that Meyer did and really validate the fact that his photos were for real and someone is actually coming here. All right, how much can you tell us about the people who are taking these photographs? And this is someone who has been in contact with these people uh, these uh, aliens for 26 years, is that about, correct? About 29 years. Actually, 29 it just years. happened to me before Christmas. I had, uh, you know, as you know, I've got a book, The Pleiadian Mission, on the market, and I've been out doing some promotions and talks. And I was in Florida giving a talk uh, about the book, and a man came up to me afterwards, after the talk, a uh, very nice fellow that had been sitting there throughout the, the talk. And he proceeded to tell me that he'd been having uh, contacts, and he had a surprise for me. And I says, what's that? And he says, do you remember about six years ago when you were visiting, that's me, over to uh, Billy Meyer in Switzerland? And I says, yeah, I was over there. And uh, he says, uh, you were receiving some unusual dreams and visions, weren't you, when you were sleeping? And I said, yes, I was. There was a few occasions where things were happening that I didn't quite understand. And I seemed to be hearing voices in my head directing me to learn what I can and keep on going. Yes. And uh, I said, what, what's the significance of that? He says, well, I've been having contacts with the Pleiadians for almost 29 years. And six years ago, they um, were asking him if he'd be willing to be a contactee and go forward into the public and talk about his experiences. And he told them that he w did not. He did not want to get out into the public arena. He was you know, very leery of doing that. And they told him at that time about me that I was over there learning from Billy Meyer and that I lived on the West Coast and that when the time was right, they would uh, have him contact me to tell his story. Now, he's telling me all this in the lobby of a hotel, mm -hmm. and I'm sitting there listening very calmly you know, to all of this, and he's telling me how they've been listening to my thoughts and waiting six years for the right time. And he said, he looks me squarely in the eye and says, the time is right. They've decided to start a new series of contacts that 1995 is the year of change here on the planet. It is the beginning of a new time period when natural disasters are going to increase to tremendous proportions. Boy. And it will mark the beginning of a new era. And they feel it's important that they start stimulating consciousness and educate people on how to live through this, not be fearful, and develop their own spiritual power. All right. Well, I've got to stop you there for a moment. I had a man uh, that I am very impressed with on this program about a week ago. His name is Gordon Michael Scallion. Do you know the name? Yeah, I've had dinner with Gordon. I know him. All right. He made some predictions, uh, uh, frankly, that would curl your hair about the West Coast. And they're near near term predictions. Mm -hmm. um, what do you know of that would either tend to validate or not validate predictions of uh, very soon coming uh, Earth changes? Well, all I can tell you is that two weeks ago on the phone, the man in uh, Florida told me he had just had a contact, and it was about that. Uh, it wasn't about California; it was about Florida. 
and uh, he said that they wanted him to be aware of the increase in problems. I asked him if there was any news about California, and he said at the time they didn't tell him anything, that, uh, that the, there would be a major quake, several of them here in California, but it, was, it wasn't time for them yet. And he was telling me about a hurricane that's going to hit down in Florida uh, that they allowed him to see and envision. And so I'm not sure what uh, uh, things that Gordon might have said. I didn't hear the show, so I don't know what he was saying about the current things here in California. But we certainly are living on the edge of things. But there's nothing from the Pleiadians at the moment to either validate that or not. All right, but a hurricane in Florida. Yeah, he says there's a two-year uh, uh, time period that in approximately two years that uh, one of the hurricanes is going to be so big in the Atlantic Ocean that a wall of water will wash totally over Florida and submerge it. Oh, my. Yeah, he says there will be no more Florida in about two years. Uh, the whole southern part of it is going to go underwater, and the, the wave of water will be so big and so fast that it will sweep inland and rush all the way up through the eastern boundary coast of the United States. And... Uh, pretty much run the coastline. Talk about a rogue wave. Well, uh, interestingly enough, Meyer said the same thing 20 years ago. Uh, he was asking him about the future, and they told him the same thing, that well, by around the turn of the century that the hurricanes would increase tremendously, and so would the earthquakes. And now they seem to be stepping up the contact, saying that uh, 95 is the year we start really paying attention because they really step up. Mm -hmm. Well, Gordon did uh, make a prediction with regard to hurricanes in Florida. And did he? So yeah, he did. Well, no, he's probably tuning in then because there are, there are many people who have learned the ability through meditation to shift their consciousness into a neutral state, and you can draw upon events from the past and the future. It's rather a common technique taught to people, especially in the East, when they learn to meditate. All right. Well, look, let us begin. I know there's a lot more to tell, but there's a lot of people on the phones, too, that want to talk to you, and All maybe right. that will draw us into some interesting directions. Okay. So let's go to the phone lines and see what awaits. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Randolph Winters. Hi. Hey, how you doing? Okay, sir. Where are you? Uh, Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Okay. Uh, gee, Alabama, where the uh, tornado just ripped through here recently. That's right, in Arab. Yes, Arab, uh, Alabama. Yes, sir. Um, I have a question for your guest. All right. Okay. Um, I was wondering if you'd ever read a book called The Rainbow Conspiracy by Brad Steiger and his and Sharon Hansen Steiger. No, I haven't. Okay. Um, it talks about different ETIs that have basically had contact with the Earth since 1943. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's different groups. Supposedly, and uh, the group that's in question, the Pleiadians, that you've been talking about? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, sir. Are they the ones that, you know, the, that we commonly think of, like with the close encounters and third count? You know, oh, okay. The two guys, all right, all right, all right. Thank you. Uh, from Alabama. Um, close Encounters of the Third Kind uh, was a very impressive movie that seemed to be one of the first of the genre that is sort of getting us accustomed to thinking about this whole topic. Mm -hmm. uh, do you look at the, uh, the current crop of motion pictures and television shows, uh, X-Files and all the rest of them the same way? Well, pretty much. I think for years we've been slowly indoctrinated, and there has been an effort by certain parts of our government to encourage Steven Spielberg and others to do materials along the way to slowly wake people up and get them prepared. Uh, a lot of the public is probably not aware that uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind was made twice, that originally the script was entirely different. It was about a family in Arkansas who was abducted, and it was a very dramatic thing. And as Steven was going through his dailies, as the movie progressed, the time he got to end, it became too scary. He thought it was too, you know, be too dark yes. for people. And they scrapped the whole project, threw the whole thing away, and went back and remade it. And we got the little warm and fuzzy creature. Yeah. Yeah. yeah then, then along came E.T. later. But Close Encounters then came out to be almost a friendly uh, thing, uh, you know, where we have our first encounters with beings from another world. Oh, it absolutely was. At the end, when they walked down, they were yeah. holding hands and all the rest of it. Right. It was wonderful. And uh, the beings that were depicted in there were more like the gray types from Zeta Recticula, the non-human types, where the Pleiadians are human just like ourselves. And for your caller in Alabama there, Pleiadians would pass in a crowd. Uh, we are the same genetic family they are. And we could see them on the street and probably not even notice them. They look just like us, and All unfortunately, right. they're very similar. All right. West of the Rockies, you're on the air with Randolph Winters. Hi. Hello there. 
Uh, my name is John from Jacksonville, Oregon. Yes, sir. Uh, I grew up in Miami, Florida, and in 1968 I was listening to a radio show on the Sally Jesse show uh, on WKAT in Miami. Right. And uh, there was a man on the air that claimed he was in uh, touch with extraterrestrials, and he'd been living in Philadelphia, and he said that that in order to uh, bring uh, the people to awareness about about um, UFOs and extraterrestrials, he was going to manipulate the uh, sports games. <laughs> and, and he uh, he probably caused the, the current baseball strike, huh? <laughs> well, he he made a prediction that uh, the Miami Dolphins would be would become the most winningest team in in the history of football. And now he lives in Las Vegas, no doubt, and uh, and uh, 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 makes wagers. All right, on the wild card line, you're on the air with Randolph Winters. Hello. Hi there. Uh, I have a real quick question. Uh, Randolph, did I understand you to say that uh, Billy Meyer had been in a similar uh, role in previous lifetimes on Earth? Yes, that's what he believes. He thinks it's happened several times. He thinks his first lifetime was about uh, about 11,000 years back and has had many lifetimes uh, as a capacity as a contactee. In my book I've got out, The Pleiadian Mission, he told me that he was also Galileo and had lived that lifetime and had served that one function in uh, you know, trying to convince man as Galileo did, you know, that the, you know, we were round and, uh, you know, we were revolving around the sun. So he, he believes that he's had many lifetimes in a similar capacity, and he believes that he will have six more here on Earth, and then he thinks that he will be returning to the planet that he came from. Okay. My, my, yeah, that, that was my question, is, is would there have been anybody that we had heard of that he had, uh, that he had existed as? Well, Galileo was one that he talked about. He'd mentioned a couple others, which I didn't know about, and... Uh, uh, he also mentioned that uh, there was a connection somehow to Enoch, but he wasn't sure, real clear what that was. Oh, my. Most of his life he had been challenged by the Pleiadians to try to figure it out himself. It's kind of an exercise for his own spiritual development. Uh -huh. So they have not um, clarified or endorsed any of his discoveries one way or the other. They're letting him figure it out. But he feels strongly that he was Galileo and a couple of others, but this is not the, the Pleiadians telling him that. They're just telling him that he's had them, and they're challenging him to figure it out. Okay, thanks a lot. All right, yeah, thank you fun. very much for the call. Um, yeah, good calls. On the first-time caller line, you're on the air with Randolph Winters. Hi. Hello. Hello. Uh, I have a question in regards to the Roswell in incident. All right, sir, where are you? I am in uh, Texas. Texas. All right. Uh, what's your question? My question is, is there any tie between the Pleiadians and the Roswell incident? And I'll hang up and listen for your answer. All right. Okay. And so here it comes. Uh, not that we know of, except that the beings in the Roswell incident, which we now call greys and are from a binary star system called uh, Zeta Recticuli, are on kind of an open commerce basis with the Pleiadians, meaning that they get along, they share facilities, uh, we're learning now through these new contacts that the Pleiadians uh, have a couple of bases here in the United States, which are only for themselves, but share a base, an undersea base, off the coast of Puerto Rico with the Greys. So they're aware of them, uh, work with them, and seem to get along. But the Pleiadians themselves had nothing to do with the incident in Roswell. That was the ships that crashed where were just uh, the ships of the Greys. All right. Um, east of the Rockies, you're on the air with Randolph Winters. Hi. Uh, good evening, or good morning, sir. My name is Edward. I'm calling from San Antonio. San Antonio, Texas. Yes, Edward. Uh, I have two quick questions. I'm wondering, I usually hear that there are seven separate sets of aliens. One group is described as the Nordics. I'm wondering, is that the Palladians? And secondly, if there are new souls and old souls, where do the new souls come from? Oh, yeah. Okay, good. Um, the Nordics, uh, do Nordics equal Pleiadians? We, we haven't figured that out. It's, we've been suspicious of that for a long time. Uh, if they're Pleiadians, they haven't admitted it, uh, because the Nordics, the so-called Nordics, these tall blondes that have been associated with the Greys on several occasions, uh, have been mentioned by any number of people who've had abduction cases. Mm -hmm. But we don't know. We don't have any evidence yet to say that they're Pleiadians, but they seem to look and act the same. So it might be of the same family uh, chain someplace. All right, good. Um, with regard to souls, this is something I've always wondered about, too. 
Um, is there, are there a fixed number of souls? It's always been a great mystery to people with the population increase on Earth. Uh, if no. there are a fixed number of souls, where do the new ones come from? That's uh, what the there is. is not a fixed number. The creational source that creates the universe is going through its own evolution, and it creates a universe to do that, and we are part of that evolution. So here on Earth, which is one of the planets that has evolved to be a kind of planet where human life is possible, there are bands of energy around the planet, different ones. And one of those bands of energy contains the energy, the spiritual energy that creates new life forms. Mm -hmm. So if we get overpopulated here and more or less kind of run out of spirit forms, you know, everybody's in body at the same time. Yes. Uh, then the creational source allows for new spirits to come into life. And what happens is there's a problem, and this is going on on Earth, by the way, right now. If a new spirit comes into life, it has not lived any lifetimes yet, has no accumulated wisdom with it, and frankly doesn't even know how to control the body that it's in. And in many cases, these are the people we describe as mentally ill or unable to even control their own bodies. And we look at them as mental illness, and in many cases they say these are just young or new spirits which are brought into material bodies that are too old for them to handle and they can't cope. All right, Randolph, uh, we're at the bottom of the hour. That sounds like a good break point. Stay right there, and we'll come right back to you into telephone calls now with my guest, Randolph Winters. He's here talking about the Pleiadians and Billy Meyer and the new photographs of beam chips, which I have in my hot little palm and which we will be publishing. This is CBC. On Talk 102. Hour of Art Bell was recorded for rebroadcast at this time. Please do not call. From the Kingdom of Nod, this is Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell on the CBC Radio Network. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, for those of you sitting out there this morning going, oh, come on, what a bunch of junk. Maybe. I have no way of knowing. I do know the photographs that I hold in my hand are very, 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 very impressive. And uh, we will be publishing these. These are the latest Pleiadian ship photographs. They are the same ships photographed by Billy Meyer in one of the best documented uh, UFO cases in all of history. We are deviating from our normal discussion of current events this morning, and I do that every now and then on this program because one does not live by current events alone. After fate 6-4. Well, okay, this is current, so I feel I should get it on the air. It just came in by fax from Tom and Kathy in Pollock Pines, California. Dear Art, at approximately 1 a.m. Pacific time, that would have been about uh, uh, 38 minutes ago, I was outside and saw what appears, yes, appears to be, and it's still there, a gold star in the sky. I'm very near Lake, Ta Lake Tahoe, and to me, looking uh, straight up, it's southwest. A friend of mine says it's moving. We've been watching it for the last ten minutes, looking at it with binoculars. It has a very bright white light surrounding it. If you look straight up, and just look around, you can't miss it. It's very bright, gold-colored. Great show. Kathy, thought that would I I'd get that on the air for any of you who happen to feel like wandering out and taking a look who are in the area. All right, back now to Randolph Winters and your calls. You know our number. If you want to get through, pick up a telephone and uh, participate. Randolph, are you there? Yes, I am, and you know, Art, that's, uh, I'm glad to hear that uh, fax come in because that area is known for gold chips. Uh, the Pleiadians tell us that there is a group of people living under Mount Shasta in Northern California. Somebody wanted me to ask about Mount Shasta. Yeah, Mount Shasta, the descendants of a race of people called Hyperboreans live down there, and they are technically advanced and have craft. And their craft are gold in color and are commonly seen as kind of gold orbs in the sky. And many, uh, many of the ships that we see uh, sometimes in the air are their craft in uh, the California, Nevada area. So they may be right now outside looking at a hyperborean craft. Uh, Randolph, what do you say to people who might be tuning in, uh, just tuned in the last half hour or so, listen to what you've had to say, and they say, now, this guy's a total fruitcake. Mm -hmm. What do you say to those people? 
Well, I don't blame him for saying that, uh, you know, because the things that the path that I've gone down and the things I've been exposed to has been over a several year period. I would have thought pretty much the same thing 10, 15 years ago. And we are on the verge of discovering a whole new kind of reality on this planet. And people just have to go out, and if they're interested, go out, get involved, listen to shows like yours, and read some books, and they'll find out that there really are a lot of things going on. But we all have to find truth for ourselves. So it's a good time to open our minds up, be a little patient, and, uh, you know, don't accept things blindly. But on the other hand, go out and be inquisitive. And you will find that there's a lot of activity going on around the world. All right, back to the lines. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Randolph Winters. Hello. Hi, Art. This is Vinny in Wichita. Hello, Vinny. Mr. Winters. Nice Hi, Vinny. Again. Uh, I'm real interested in the grays. Mm -hmm. Do we have any idea what it is they're after and, and what is their uh, goals? Also, uh, I think I've heard somebody mention Billy Meyer in connection with the uh, Talmud of Emmanuel, and I wish you'd elaborate on that. Thank you. All right. All right. Well, uh, thanks for the call from Wichita. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be in Wichita Saturday and March 4th doing a little talk there in Wichita. So uh, maybe I'll see Vinny there. I'm not sure. Yes. <laughs> uh, the Grays, yeah, we first came in contact with them in 1947. As far as we know, the Roswell case was the first indication. And originally we called them EBs. That was the military designation for them. They were called extraterrestrial biological entities. And over a series of years, uh, because of their skin color, we've come to call them Grays. Uh, some has known about them. We, uh, one of the crashes, one of the bodies was alive, and it was taken to an Air Force base in New Mexico where uh, they tried to examine uh, the body because it seemed to be unhealthy. The poor little creature was seen to be dying, and they uh, didn't know how to take care of him because their anatomy is entirely different than ours. They're not human as we are. And so there was no heart, lungs, and internal organs for them to examine and no blood for a doctor to figure out what the heck was happening to poor, this poor little creature. Eventually, they called in a snake doctor, literally, and his name was Garcia. And this creature uh, from this little gray or EB uh, took a liking to Dr. Garcia and started communicating with him telepathically. And because of that, he lived for about a year, by the way. And because of that, some knowledge was gained about their race and who they are and why they were coming from here. And a book was put together and uh, that's kept, of course, by the military. And the code name for that information, that book, is called The Yellow Pages. And, uh, which I thought was kind of cute. All right, all right. Um, he uh, he also asked about the uh, Talmud of Emmanuel. Yeah, uh, a very fascinating little book and gets us back to the Pleiadian information. Uh, among the things that Meyer was asking the Pleiadians, of course, was about God and Jesus and uh, what information they may have on that. And the Talmud of Emmanuel is the translation of some Aramaic scrolls that the Pleiadians caused to be dug up in 1963. Are they say these were among the original writings of Emmanuel, known to the rest of us as Jesus, during his lifetime while he was still alive, actual writings that he wrote and that had been buried, and they uh, led a Greek Orthodox minister to dig them up. He translated them from Aramaic uh, into Greek. They eventually made their way into German, and now they're available in English in this little book called The Talmud of Emmanuel. It's pretty hard to get a hold of. I've got some copies here. If anybody wants to, then call the 800 number, and I'll shoot them out one. But the book is a translation of those Aramaic scrolls and has, after scrutiny by Christian historians, believe that it is the original writings of Emmanuel before he passed away. So it's a pretty interesting little book, and for anybody who wants to follow that path, uh, give me a ring, and I'll shoot a book off to you. All right. Uh, what is Billy Meyer doing today? Billy is still alive. He still lives in uh, Schmidt Rudy, Switzerland. Uh, he's frankly not doing too much. Uh, his health isn't good, uh, but he is still with us anyway. And he's kind of left the work, uh, you might say, of the mission up to the people around him. Mm -hmm. Billy's gotten a little lethargic and uh, is a little worn out emotionally and for the most part uh, is just taking it easy. Are you now a disciple of Billy Meyer? No, I, don't, I was never quite a disciple. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I... When going over there, I made three trips over there over a three-year period to stay for several months each time to learn what I could. And it was just for my own path. And, and getting involved with the group over there, I became a member and finally caught myself uh, getting caught up in member stuff, you know, being uh, only being able to do this, only being able to talk about Billy material. And so I quit. And I, I'm not a follower type. I'm not much for one to get into groups in that kind of closed-minded situation. So... 
Uh, once I quit the group, which was in 90, that kind of cut me off from uh, privileged information from the group, so I, I haven't gone over there since. All right. Are you convinced beyond a reasonable doubt, to use an OJism, mm -hmm. that all of this is real? i tell you what I'm convinced of, pretty, uh, pretty much convinced. Uh, I was never, when I was traveling over to Myers, I was never convinced that it was real 100%. I was always trying to keep about 10, 20% of my mind, you know, open to another solution, another possibility. And I was never convinced that they were from the Pleiades. It always occurred to me there might be other societies here on Earth that had just like this that, uh, you know, might be wanting to call themselves ETs, and maybe there was another answer to all of this. So I've kept my mind open to it, and I've closed the gap, I, I guess you might say, recently by virtue of the new contacts that are happening now. Same craft, same photos, new information, uh, which to me really validates the fact that they're real, it's happening. I still have a few doubts in my mind about who's in those ships and really who they may be, but I'd say I'm close to 99% convinced it's all happening. All right. Yeah, that, that really was the question. East yeah. of the Rock. First time callers, area 702-727-1222. Okay, we're going to have to, uh, yeah, we're going to have to start all over again here, um, because I had to take that out. Uh, your first name is Jack, and you're calling from where, Jack? Charleston, South Carolina. Okay, go ahead. And uh, I want to ask Mr. Winters about, uh, something I saw on the studies television program a while ago. Uh, it was videotapes taken, I think, in the late 80s at an air show in Mexico City, and it was different angles of one craft uh, taking for, like, different distances uh, from Mexico City during an air show. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if those could be Pleiadian beings, if you're familiar with that. All right, that is a very good question. Uh, there have been a lot of Mexico sightings, uh, Randolph, many, oh, yeah. many, 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 and I presume you've seen some of the photos. Are they uh, Pleiadian craft? Yes, there are some Pleiadian crafts uh, currently even being uh, videotaped down in Mexico, uh, primarily over Mexico City and then east of there towards Puebla. There are people all throughout that area getting uh, lots of videotape, I mean hundreds of them, uh, of the Pleiadian craft, of the gray ships, and some ships we can't identify. We're getting kind of used to seeing the Pleiadian ships so we can spot them, and but the gray ships seem to be uh, different shapes and uh, different design. But for the most part, there are grays and uh, Pleiadians down there in Mexico allowing their ships to be photographed again. Mm. There's even some of the triangle, the delta-shaped craft floating over the volcanoes down there, which the grays have admitted they designed and built. I saw a triangle craft. I saw one up close. It scared the hell out of me. Did it? Uh, Randolph, yes. I saw it here in Nevada, not far from where I live. My wife saw it as well. Mm -hmm. It was without question something that either we have and we haven't uh, told anybody about, or it was from elsewhere. It did not fly. It floated. Mm -hmm. It floated uh, about 150 feet above me. It was close enough on a full, near, nearly a full moon night that I could see the substance of the craft. Mm -hmm. And I watched it float right over me, and I watched it float right out across the valley. It's the only sighting I've ever had, and I'd swear on a stack of Bibles that it was true. I saw one of those, Randolph. I don't know what the hell it was, mm -hmm. but it was nothing we uh, we presently have that I know about. Well, I know that, you know, in your neck of the woods out there, we've got dreamland, and we are experimenting with some things, and I don't know the shape of the aurora and the crafts that we're playing with. It might have been a gray device. This was a pure triangle. Pure triangle. Huh? Pure triangle. It had uh, two white lights on uh, the back of the triangle as it progressed from the, the rear actually coming from a uh, easterly direction to a westerly direction roughly and um, a strobing red light in the front it made no noise it was utterly silent and it was not flying I was in the Air Force I know flying <laughs> I know aerodynamics it was floating and um, it raised the hair on the back of my neck but I, I did it's my one big sighting it was about a year and a half ago and I, I, as I said, I'd swear in a stack of Bibles about what I saw. So Yeah, we were talking a moment ago about truth to all of this, and I, I think one thing we should tell all of our listeners, there are many things flying in the sky these days, some hours, some there, some unknown. But, yeah, our skies are filled with all sorts of uh, technologies, for, and uh, we're about to have a big awakening. Linda Howe, who was on my Dreamland program uh, last week, Randolph, uh, did you happen to hear it? No, I, I can't get your dreamland in my area. I see. Um, 
You you should be able to get it on Kogo, K O G O uh, San Diego six hundred on the dial. All right, I'll give that another try. Uh, at any rate, um, she said that she has information that the U.S. government is now experimenting with a craft that has the ability to modify uh, light emissions, uh, much the way uh, they have been able to do sound cancellation. In other words. Uh, sound 180 degrees out of phase that will then cause you to hear no sound at all, mm -hmm. and that I know has been done, but she's saying that they're now experimenting with a visual technology uh, that, that will affect um, your eye just the way sound cancellation does, but with visual frequencies, and that that accounts for the craft that are seen almost blinking in and out of physical existence, and there have been a lot of reports like that. Mm -hmm. um, have you heard anything about that? Not the technology, but I've seen some of those craft, the blinking things. Uh, in Sedona a couple of times I've seen them. Mm -hmm. But, uh, no, that's good that she's on track with that. I wasn't aware of that in the technology. All right. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Randolph Winters. Hello. Uh, yes, Mr. Winters. Where are you, sir? I'm calling from eastern Oklahoma. Okay. Okay. Uh, Two questions. One, are you aware of any of the ETs that are not, uh, say, friendly with Pleiadians? And two, I do believe there is an outpost up there and Mount Shasta, and some of them are mingling with the people. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Yes, we hear a lot of stories about Shasta. Um, are there ETs or variations of them? that are not friendly with the Pleiadians, or for that matter, would not be considered our friends? Yes, there are. The Pleiadians have commented that there are good and bad all over the place out there. and Some of these races are quite barbaric, come by here occasionally, do take people, uh, and they do afford us a certain measure of protection from that element and have for quite a period of time. And that's one of the things that concerns them, that this protection they afford us will cease once we have the technical ability to leave our own solar system. And they are kind of concerned that, you know, who we're going to align ourselves with and how we're going to take care of ourselves. Are they, in effect, uh, our protectors now? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, they say they have sensing devices all over the place around the planet. When any crafts come in, uh, the, uh, the crafts are warned that they and their technology are here and to uh, leave us alone. Mm -hmm. And that helps in most cases, but they say not everybody pays attention. And occasionally some crafts do get in, and there are some very barbaric types out there. As far as the ones that we know about, I can tell you this, that uh, White Sands, New Mexico, uh, forgot the year, I think it's 51 or 52, uh, a man I know was sitting, uh, working his job at CIA headquarters in Washington, D.C. His job was to receive emergency phone calls from uh, Air Force bases. Picks up the phone one night, and he's getting a call from a base in New Mexico that there is a disc on the ground. Uh, it has not exploded. It's intact. It's sitting on the ground. And, uh somewhere out of New Mexico, what should they do? Uh, he turns to the general at the Pentagon who gives him his, you know, commands, and the general tells him uh, the commands to give back to these, this field crew out of New Mexico. Uh, he's the liaison between Washington and this crew. He's then told by his general to get on a plane and get out there and see what's going on. When he arrives, there's a disc setting there on the ground. It's 99 feet in diameter. The military, of course, is there. Hundreds of them are surrounding the things. For hours, they've been trying to get it open, get into it, get something done. They can't get into it. They're working with torches and all sorts of equipment. This is the early 50s now. Uh, eventually, after a few hours, a hatch or doorway opens in the side of the thing. Frightens them all to death. Uh, they're scared to death to go in. A few young men, though, are told to grab their guns and march inside. When they get inside of the thing, uh, they find that there are small dead bodies laying on the floor about four feet long that look slightly reptilian. Uh, they are not human like us. They have skin much like a lizard, something like that. It goes all the way up their back. Uh, on the top of their head, there's kind of a reptilian sort of ridge. Mm -hmm. Their faces are kind of uh, reptilian looking. They have small claw-like uh, hands with three claws, small tail about six inches long. And then the most disturbing thing of all happens as they're investigating the ship, they pull a door open on what looks like a room, and inside of the room are human body parts. 
arms, legs, and so forth, all in oh, pieces. Yeah. And they're scared to death. They're panicked. They run out of the side of the ship. I understand. Yeah, and uh, we have come to call these little beings the reptilians. And information sources uh, believe that they are a very warlike, uh, aggressive race that sometimes uses these little greys for their own bidding. Uh, it is assumed that um, they're very hostile. Uh, they do come here from time to time. Apparently, technically, they're not near as advanced as the Pleiadians. Their ships do not have the interdimensional capabilities, and we are afforded a certain measure of protection uh, from them by the Pleiadians and other human races. So I don't know that we have too much to fear from them, but they do exist. All right. There was a recent story. It was either Sightings or 2020 or a fairly uh, legitimate media source. Uh, about the now open Russian files, Randolph, mm -hmm. there was a ship that appeared over a Russian missile silo. The ship hovered over the silo for a period of time, and the missile, the nuclear device inside the missile itself, activated and began a launch sequence. Mm -hmm. I saw this myself. Uh, I saw this story, and uh, this is legitimate Russian reporting and apparently they have photographs of the disk that hovered and they have very careful records because they keep very very careful controls uh, over nuclear uh, uh, missiles in Russia it's uh, a very centralized control it's very much unlike our system and it scared the uh, you know what out of them and uh, on hearing the report myself as well now that is not a friendly thing to do Randolph no, it's not. It may have been accidental, or uh, I don't know why, why they would have done that. But um... I, I believe that after the incident, the Russians tore apart all the control panels, mm -hmm. all of the uh, launch sequence computers, and found absolutely, of course, nothing. Mm -hmm. And that one scared me. Uh, that that is not a friendly act. So no, it's not. <laughs> that goes toward your uh, your. All right, we're going to pause right here, Randolph. Stay right there. We are now at the top of yet another hour. Some of you, uh, sadly, will no doubt leave us at this hour and miss what is to come. For those of you that must leave, um, have a wonderful holiday weekend. For those of you that will be back, there is more. I'm Art Bell, and this is Coast to Coast AM. It's a holiday weekend. We're taking a bit of a different turn. My guest is Randolph Winters with the story of Billy Meyer. We'll be back. Over any minute. And uh, it did. Up over the horizon, it was first just kind of a white ball of light. And uh, it looked kind of like a shooting star going backwards when I first saw it. And uh, craft come flying up over the horizon and shot up over the farmhouse, slowed down and just kind of spun around there for a couple seconds and then shot off. I mean, did it look like a disc? No, I couldn't tell you, to be quite honest. What I saw was a round ball of light at night. Right. Uh, they put off an energy field around them that uh, at night it kind of glows. So you can't, you don't know exactly what you're looking at, except you're looking at something white that's round that's awful fast. And when it took off, it just zigzagged out of there and shot off and uh, was gone like in a flash. So, you know, I, I didn't get to see them in the daytime, and I didn't get to see, uh, you know, take any photos or anything. So, But I did have an appointment, which I thought was nice. <laughs> an appointment? Yeah, I have to see them, and he arranged it and says, oh, oh I see there at 10 minutes yeah. after 12, yeah. they're coming over the house. Yeah, that doesn't happen too often. Yeah, I, he got a phone call, and, and how does he communicate? Telepathically, does he yeah. He says it's telepathic that uh, when he was a small boy, uh, he had his first contacts, and they took him on board the craft, and they, he said they did something to his mind, uh, that the, some sort of device was attached to his head, and it changed the way that he thought, and uh, after that, he could telepathically hear them quite well, and he could understand them. Previous to that, he said he had heard them in his head, but didn't know what the heck it was, and it kind of, you know, scared him and confused him. But after he had a contact, they did something and uh, open up something in his spiritual uh, self that he can understand them. Well, and the, the name of the book is The Pleiadian? Pleiadian Mission. Pleiadian. Uh, he says that they come from a small cluster of stars that we call the Pleiades. And that's in the Taurus section of the sky for people that might be looking out there. Right. 
And um, there are seven little stars out there that kind of look like a mini dipper, very small. And he says uh, that they come from that area of the sky. There's uh, one of the stars in the Pleiades is called Tegeta. And uh, he says they come from that area. It's about 500 light years away. And has this changed your life? I mean, obviously, if you have written a book about it, uh, you're getting publicity. You have a business, you say, uh, uh, software for banks. Uh, does this hurt you in any way? No, actually not. Uh, I went there out of personal interest, and um, uh, I'd say it's changed my life a lot. I mean, it's it's certainly increased uh, the size of the world that I live in. It changes your thinking. And then after I spent a lot of time with him and started uh, you know, reading and listening to all the things that he had learned about history and science and other things, and, yeah, it really broadens your horizons and changes the way that you think. But I think more than anything else, uh, the biggest thing, impact is then just uh, sharing it with other people and uh, what it does to you know to to learn so much and to talk to many people I after I got to know him uh, and like I mentioned it was just my own personal quest to begin with I wasn't an investigator and I wasn't you know out to tell the world all about it or anything I went there out of my own curiosity so when I got home um, and I live in the LA area when I got back, a lot of my uh, friends uh, wanted to hear about what happened and see some of the photos, you know, curiosity. So uh, I said, well, sure, come on over Sunday and, you know, bring anybody who's interested and I'll show you the photos and tell you what I've learned so far. So I, uh, Sunday afternoon came and I ran down the market, I think, and got a couple of bottles of soda and some chips or something, expecting, you know, a half dozen people. People started showing up. They kept showing up. Pretty soon we had hundreds of people up and down the street. The police came to see what was going on. There was a lot of people interested. And uh, I, couldn't, of course, couldn't get them all even the house. So I said, well, I think we're going to have to rent a hall. And uh, so the next week I rented, uh, I think it was called the Women's Club, something like that, a local hall in our community there. And uh, about four or 500 people showed up to hear about this. Well, one thing led to another, and I was asked if I'd come back the next week, and more people showed up. And that just kept on going on. Uh, people were showing up every week wanting to hear about this, and I found myself in kind of a unique position. So it's changed my life a lot yeah, over good. the years, just, you know, falling into that situation and then uh, realizing there was so much to be learned from these people from other worlds. Uh, I finally just wrote a book all about it. All right, I tell you what, can we put you on hold a second? Uh, we're going to come back and talk more with you in a minute. Uh, we need to take care of some business. Randy Winters, uh, the author of a book called The Pleiadian Mission, and his visit to Switzerland to talk to this man who has been supposedly communicating with extraterrestrials for many, many years. He's coming to Pekin, that's why we're talking with Randy. He's going to be in Pekin Saturday night, and we'll tell you where and when and how all those details. Coming up after Russell Limbaugh on Talk 102. <laughs> It is 726, it's 34 degrees. Our next news coming up in less than 20 minutes, but first, more of the Batten Experience on Talk 102. See, I like, the, I like this kind of music, and I like to hear that the, the aliens that have visited Mr. Meyer over there in Switzerland, that he's, that he's a calm human being. I would hate to think that they would cause us to be, like, all jumpy. Out. He, he's at peace with himself. Randy Winter's written a book about this guy. Pleiadian Mission, right? Yeah, the Pleiadian Mission, uh, the book concerns itself really with these beings, who they are, and why they came here. It's, I think the book is mostly uh, kind of a spiritual experience because it, it definitely changes your consciousness even to read it and to experience what's in there. So. Well, why are they here? Why are they visiting us, according well, to Billy and you and, and all your research? Well, as we're finding out, they've been here a long time. Apparently, they've been kind of keeping an eye on our civilization, you know, for thousands of years, and but mostly as observers. And uh, they felt uh, the last hundred years or so that it seems to be important that they try to get a little involved with us. And I think they're really trying to just kind of help us out a little bit. They see all the problems we're having, and they've tried to find a way perhaps to lend us a hand, you know, without getting involved. 
they as individuals seem to have a, a personal code that doesn't allow them to you know get involved in our decision making they they don't want to impede upon our right of free will but yet they seem to be trying to find a way to kind of help us out a little bit so now, now randy there's been so many hundreds and thousands of reports of people who claim to have alien encounters now we know all of them aren't true but let's say that some of them are true if there are people from other planets or solar systems or galaxies that have the capability to come here why hasn't say a race of a certain a, a certain alien race a uh, maybe not so nice alien race who uh, whose intention was basically just to overtake the earth and to rule the earth why haven't we had them show up actually we have uh it has happened a little bit, but things like that generally don't make the news because the military gets involved, and of course they don't want to cause panic. But I can tell you there are races that come here that are quite barbaric, and fortunately for us, uh, the Pleiadians, which are human just like us, they look just like we are, no difference. Uh, they afford us a certain measure of protection, but they tell us on uh, occasion every now and then uh, other races do come by here, which are uh, quite savage and barbaric. Occasionally do abduct people, uh, take them, and uh, uh, probably would try to take the planet over if we were protected a little bit. I can tell you from uh, second-hand experience, a friend of mine who is uh, in the CIA told me that uh, just a few years ago they had a report came in that there was a downed saucer in New Mexico. And uh, it was his job. He was in Washington, D.C., and he was the man who answered the phone when an Air Force base called with an emergency situation. And it was his job to turn. He was in the Pentagon. It was his job to give the information, you know, to the people there to make the decisions on what to do. So a call came in that a craft was down and that the military had surrounded it and they wanted to know what to do. So he sent information back to them to, you know, try to get the thing open. And uh, this went on for several hours. And uh, after a few hours of this, he was told to get on a plane and get out to New Mexico and see firsthand for himself what was going on. Well, when he got out there, the military, there was, you know, they had surrounded the craft, could not get it open so far. Uh, they'd been trying torches and everything they could. The disc was about 99 feet in diameter, did not crash. It apparently just sat down on the ground and uh, been sitting there for hours. Well, it, it took them several hours trying to get into the thing, and all of a sudden uh, a hatchway just opened up. And uh, when they went inside, they found that uh, the occupants, uh, the people who had been flying it, weren't people at all. They were small, four-foot-tall little beings uh, that actually had kind of uh, reptilian, scaly kind of skin. Uh, very ugly little creatures with short, ta uh, short tails and hands were kind of like claws. Uh, as they were examining the craft, they found a room. When they opened up uh, one of the rooms in the craft, they found human body parts, which scared them to death. And uh, apparently they had discovered a race of people, uh, reptilian, that uh, whatever they were doing with the human body parts, they had ripped them all to pieces. They didn't know if they'd been eating them, tore them up, or what, what had caused it. But we've uh, had some contact with this race. Uh, some people call them draconians. Some people call them dracos. We don't know the exact name that the military has given to them, but these beings do come here occasionally and are apparently quite harmful to us. Okay, so my question is why doesn't uh, if if enough of this information is is uh, out there uh to 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 detail it in that much detail and why doesn't the, the government just uh, or the military just come out and say all right yeah okay we have had encounters here's the situation there's nothing to panic about or maybe there is something to panic I, well I mean, there is something to panic see, about. but i don't think people would panic uh well we don't know for sure but you know the you must remember that this has started 40, 50 years ago when we had our first contacts with ETs and the military first became aware of it. And originally, uh, the, the crash ships that came down in Roswell, New Mexico back in 47 was our first kind of military encounter with this. And they didn't realize it was even going to continue. So at first it was thought of, uh, you know, this is an isolated incident. Then it happened a couple of times again. And as the military does, they, of course, their first idea was, well, you know, what are the military uh, uh, situation here? They were interested in trying to learn something, uh, 
and were faced with the problem of trying to defend the country. It was thought back then that this was probably just a, you know, a strange accident that may never happen again. And when it continued, uh, the military got preoccupied with trying to learn something, to gain weaponry, to try to find something out about it. And at the time, it was thought it was best to keep it from the public because they didn't want to do. And then over the years, this kind of got out of hand, and uh, now the military is aware that uh, most of the major governments on Earth have had some sort of contact with ETs at different levels. And there's kind of a scramble going on the past few years at trying to learn and develop technology from the ETs, not only to defend ourselves, but to defend ourselves from different uh, countries here, even on Earth. So there's a real race going on, a technical race, at trying to learn and develop uh, weapons from the extraterrestrial information. Man. And people just, uh, i got to ask you a question, Randy. Did anybody go up to you and say, Randy, uh, this, this is just goofy, and I, I absolutely don't believe you, and I think you ought to seek some help? No. I mean, you're, very, you're a very reasonable uh, man, you, you have a software company, you you haven't been doing this for very long. I mean, this is not some possession. You know, some people get into a subject and that's all they ever think about. Mm -hmm. you, you don't impress me as being that kind of a person. No, and you have to keep kind of an open mind because, uh, you, you know, you as you get more into this, you know, I've gone to conferences and you meet people and I've had the military in my house and I've gone to the FBI and given talks. So one thing kind of leads to another and you're, you know, you get, a, you get exposed to a lot of things which seem incredible. And, uh, you know, I would only say to people out there, just, you know, go slow, uh, listen carefully and keep an open mind. But, uh you know, don't don't believe everything that you hear. We are going to go through some major changes historically here in our civilization soon because I think we're only a short period away from the whole extraterrestrial thing going public, as you talked about. Well, that's because Geraldo's going to get a hold of it, and it's all over. Yeah, yeah that might do it right there, <laughs> wouldn't it? But uh, there are a lot of strange things going on, and we don't know all the answers. Even the situation with Meyer. Now, this is the most dramatic UFO case we've ever had as far as proofs, evidence, and photos, but still, we don't know who exactly is in those crafts and what's going on. Okay. Uh, so far, we're just, we're, they're telling us they're from the Pleiades, and they fly in magnetic craft, and that we know for sure now. But that doesn't mean they're from the Pleiades. It just means somebody's flying around a magnetic craft claiming they are. Really? So there, there's still a mystery to be solved here, and uh, we have a lot more to learn. Hey, there's one thing that I, I want to ask you. I heard you talking the other day on the Art Bell program about when Neil Armstrong was on the moon, that he was out of the craft on the moon, but then he saw some flying discs, and then he jumped back in the craft and, mm -hmm. and called back to ground control. Now, I've heard a similar story to this. I want to know if you've heard of this and if you know a little bit of the background. It was one of the Apollo missions. They were in space, roughly halfway in between the Earth and the moon. And this was a satellite broadcast I heard, which was supposedly of an astronaut calling back to Houston, and the basic the kind of general, general transmission was uh, ground control, this is Apollo, we have a bogey at 12 o'clock. NASA, come again, uh, we have a bogey at 12 o'clock, it's been following us for 20 minutes and we can't shake it. And then they switched over to a protected channel. Now, my question is, have you heard of this before? And number one, is it legitimate? Is this a legitimate transmission that was recorded by someone overhearing that, that channel? I would think it would be. Um in private circles, if you talk to the astronauts, you'll find almost every Apollo mission was followed. I think, I don't remember how many astronauts there's been, up there 29 or something like that, that uh, quite a few of them have issued reports and or written books later on claiming sightings of some kind. So it, it seems like most of our Apollo missions, uh, and I'm not talking about where they met uh, ETs or something, uh, mostly they've seen light, something they can't explain, or the craft has been followed you know, by some object that they don't understand. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah, I think they've been watching them pretty close. All right, Randy, we're out of time, but uh, to tell folks more, you are going to be Saturday night at the Elks Club in Pekin, 6 p.m., uh, five bucks to get in. You're going to be bringing photos? Yeah, actually, we didn't have too much time today, but there are some new photos just taken recently uh, here in America. There's another gentleman having contacts, and we'll be showing those. Uh, and by the way, for those uh, listeners out there that don't have a chance to get out to the Elks, I've got an 800 number, and people could call and get some information on the books. And I'm actually uh, selling some some of the new photos so people can get them. All right, give me the number. Any of your listeners can call me at 800-934-6423. Mm -hmm. 
and we can give us some info, and if it's just too cold for him to get out. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's getting to be out in shirts, sleeves, and shorts this weekend in Pekin. But uh, 6 o'clock. Saturday night, Deacon's uh, Oaks Club. I think that's on Analyzer Street down there, folks. And uh, if you need more. And we can give us some info, and if it's just too cold for him to get out. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's getting to be out in shirts, sleeves, and shorts this weekend in Deacon. But uh, 6 o'clock, Saturday night, Deacon's uh, Oaks Club. I think that's on Analyzer Street down there, folks. And uh, if you need more information on exactly how to get there or whatever, you can call me. But 